go. Praise the Lord. On April 14, 1970, the people in the NASA control room were monitoring space mission Apollo 13 as it began its return trip to Earth after a successful mission. Aboard were astronauts James Lavelle, John Swigert, and Fred Hazy, and they had just completed a six-day mission. These astronauts were in space as close as any man has yet reached to the realm that we know as heaven. Out one window, they could see the magnificent creation called Earth, the single planet in the universe that God has blessed with life. Now, scientists may argue that, but they have not yet proven that. Out another window, they could see the moon and the stars and the incredible complexity of empty space. Everything during the mission had gone according to plan. Everything about this mission spoke of success. In fact, nothing seemed out of the ordinary until the control room rang with the historic words that haunt us to this day. Houston, we have a problem. Folks, this town has a problem. This state has a problem. If we're honest, this country, this world, and in fact this entire galaxy and universe have a problem. And that problem is the same regardless of where you go, how high you fly, how deep you swim, or how far you run. The problem is centuries old, and yet it is escalating in severity. Scientists are aware of the problem. And they've even go so far, gone so far as to state the nature of the problem in their second law of thermodynamics, which is called the law of entropy. Dr. Sidney Harris says this. He says, the whole universe of matter is running down and ultimately will reduce itself to uniform chaos. Let me ask you something. How many of you have ever turned on the news in the last little while and thought to yourself, we're seeing some uniform chaos? Okay, doesn't matter where you turn or what you turn on. Turn on Facebook, then turn it off again because it's nothing but uniform chaos. Turn on Twitter and listen to these tweeters. Who came up with some of these names? I mean, really? I mean, you're a twit. I mean, tweet. I mean, a tweeter. But it's uniform chaos. One person saying this, one person saying that, and both of them thinking they're right and fighting over it. It's chaos. This, this problem has shifted the very genetic makeup of life. It has caused the distortion of God's entire creation. And it even caused the mutation of numerous species of animal and plant life. The problem stems all the way back to that fateful day in the Garden of Eden. One catastrophic day when all of heaven rang with the words, Heaven, we have a problem. And from that day to this, the problem has only grown worse. Sin, my friends, sin is the problem. It has caused the death of men and women and children. It caused the animal world to turn on each other in carnivorous ways. It has caused the theory of survival of the fittest at the expense of the weak. It has caused headlines in the news, articles in the rag papers, and gossip on the internet. It has turned love into hate. It's turned marriage into divorce. It's turned attraction into lust. It's turned anger into murder. It's turned desire into theft, friendship into adultery, and art into pornography. It has caused planets to die, galaxies to collapse, and suns to burn out. There's no corner of our creation that has been unaffected by that first sin. And there's no taking it back. There's no mulligan for this one. There's no do-over. Unlike our education system right now, you do not get to just have a redo. Canes, hearing aids, inoculations, antibiotics, walkers, eyeglasses, well, except for Roger, of course, artificial limbs and wheelchairs are all results of that first sin. Roger just had eye surgery, so he's finally seeing without glasses again. He looked up and saw Linda and said, wow, I really am a blessed man, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> ha 
hospitals, morgues, abortion clinics, psychiatric wards, assistance for handicapped individuals, they're all a result of that in individual and initial sin. My family hails from Iceland. Do you know that Iceland is the only country in the world with a zero percent um, rate of Down syndrome? It's because any time a child is diagnosed with Down syndrome, they're aborted, mandated by law. Do you know that there was a, a girl in Canada who was recently euthanized? I believe she was 17. Euthanized because of the severity of her debilitating disease. What was that disease? Anxiety. This is where our world is going because of sin. I'm scared to live, so I just want to die. I'm depressed, so all I have to do is get a couple of doctors to say I'd be better off dead. Man, if that's the criteria, how many kids on the playground should just be <laughs> euthanized because other kids on the playground are saying, yeah, you're better off dead. We live in a world of uniform chaos. There's no corner of our creation that has not been affected by this. How many angelic warriors shook their heads on that day in the garden in disbelief? How could you choose that over him? How many hopes have been ruined because of that day? How many dreams have been shattered? How many lives have been lost? How many tears have been shed? This morning, I could talk about the far-reaching effect of sin, but instead, I want to take you back to that throne room in heaven that we talked about last week. I want to take you to the control room, if you will, the place where the Father sits waiting for the restoration of all things. So if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 5. It may seem like a funny thing to preach on as we go into the Christmas season, but I disagree. You want to talk about the perfect thing to talk about around Christmas, let's talk about the one who is Christmas. Let's talk about the bigness of the God who came down and filled the manger in a tiny, tiny little way. If you don't think that God's plan is incredible, I challenge you to read through the book of Revelation. You'll see just how amazing our God really is. Revelation chapter 5. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside. I want you to think about that for a second. We have 8 billion people on this planet and not one of them is worthy. There are countless billions in hell right now and none of them were worthy. And there are countless numbers in heaven right now, and none of them were worthy, including the angels. That silence that you hear right now, I kind of think that's what John must have experienced in heaven at that moment. Who is worthy? Not even the cricket spoke up. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. And then one of the elders said to me, don't weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. He has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. Pause there again. The next time you wonder if your prayers are making a difference, you remember that verse. Your prayers are filling up a bowl in heaven, and they will make a difference. They impact eternity. They change lives. They touch hearts. 
You may not see the results right now, but believe me, there will be results. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. That's why we worship in Spanish. That's why we'll worship in other languages if we need to. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. That's worship. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Father, this morning, would you add our voices to those around the throne crying out, worthy is the lamb. Would you add our worship to the adoration of the saints who are already there? Would you add our amazement to the angels who constantly see your face and yet are constantly amazed at the incredible God that they serve? And would you open our hearts and our lives, O oh God, to receive your word this morning? In Jesus' name, amen. Poor John. There he is standing in heaven the very place where all of his fellow disciples now dwelt, and he realizes that the solution to every problem in creation lies right there in front of him. In his mortal mind, he realizes that the answer to all of the what-ifs of earth was standing right there in heaven. In fact, in this chapter, John is reminded three times that the problems that surround him on earth are answered in heaven. This morning, I want to draw your attention to the solution of heaven and show you, just like the Apostle John, that there is a solution to all of your problems and mine. But to find that solution, you can't look here. You have to look there. Like John, let me remind you of the first one, and that is this. The Lion of Judah is able. In verses 1 to 5, tell me, if you were John standing in heaven and you saw God Almighty desiring to have a certain book read, wouldn't you wonder what was of such immense importance that heaven kept a record of it? Sealed up? Hey, I like to joke with some of our youth group. If 7-Eleven is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, why are there locks on the doors? <laughs> if heaven is a place filled with perfection and sinlessness, there is no thievery, there is no lying, there is no deceit, there's no backstabbing, none of that stuff in heaven, why are there seals on something that's there? John was astounded. Wouldn't you long to hear what was contained in that book? Wouldn't you just be a little bit curious? I think my wife would be going nuts. She is a very curious individual. Me, I'm not. You could put a Christmas gift in front of me at December 1st and say, don't open it. Okay. But her, she'd be picking it up and examining the size dimensions, maybe giving it a shake, sniffing it to see if there's an air aroma to it. You know, and as the season grows on, man, she'd come back to it with new ideas and new thoughts. I'd be like, oh, I forgot there's a present there. We're very, very different in that way. Most of my girls take after Micah. Every year I'd come down and there's Cassie trying to figure out under the tree what's, what's there, what's there. Me, I'm like, yeah, whatever. Wouldn't the curiosity get the better of you? John did. <laughs> John wanted to hear the contents of the book so badly, he began looking for someone, anyone please, to open the book. But there was no one. No one who was able to break the seals on the book. No one who was worthy to open the book. No one who seemed strong enough, mighty enough, or holy enough to open the book. Now, can you imagine that? You're in the presence of Gabriel, the archangel, and Michael, the archangel. 
You're in the presence of 24 elders sitting around the throne. And not one of them is worthy enough or mighty enough or holy enough or strong enough to open the book. The next time somebody tries to tell you that when you get to heaven, you're going to be just like Jesus, you point them to that verse and you remind them, nobody is like Jesus. Ever. The angels have been with him since eternity past. They're not like him. We will be with him for eternity future. We will not be like him. He is so far ahead of us that we will never get there. Heaven, we have a problem. This book needs to be read. This information needs to be shared. This proclamation needs to be given. But no one is able. Come on, God. You read it. No, I wrote it, but I'm not going to read it. Find someone else. John is nearly beside himself. In fact, in verse 4, it says, I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Like everyone else in heaven, John's heart longed to hear what is in that scroll. And like everyone else, he knew that if no one read it, there would be a big problem. Everyone would miss out. And one of the elders Perhaps one of the apostles or, or one of the patriarchs turns to John, but instead of joining John in his sorrow, he kind of gives John a gibbs. Do you know what I mean by that? Have, how many of you have ever seen NCIS on TV? No? NCIS is Naval Criminal Investigative Services, and in there there's a guy named Gibbs. And he walks up to one of his guys whenever he's acting like a turkey, and he just kind of, on the back of the head. In one episode he says, remember, a slap on the face is humiliating. A slap on the back of the head, that's encouraging. John kind of gets one of those from this elder. Whoosh, smarten up. Stop crying in heaven. Look at the lamb. Don't weep. Do you see the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David? He has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. The lion of Judah is able. But John wasn't done with this lesson. Next, the Lord shows him that the Lamb of God is worthy. In verses 6 to 10, we see this. John's attention returns to the throne of God, and there at the very center stands a lamb. But as John looks, he realizes this is no ordinary lamb, folks. I, mean, I want you to think about this. This lamb has seven horns. Have you ever seen a lamb with horns, let alone seven horns? And seven eyes. Okay, no, this is not a Chernobyl lamb. Okay? This is not a nuclear fallout result. This is not, you know, Dolly the clone lamb. No, 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 it's not that. These are the seven spirits of God being manifested in a visible way for John to be able to see. This lamb looks like it's been slaughtered. It looks cut and beaten. It has blood on its spotless wool. It has scars from terrible wounds. But there are other indications that it's a very special lamb. And it's got the eyes. It's got the horns. It's mortally wounded, and yet it's standing. It lives. An incredible holy hush falls over the entire scene as the lamb, without any fear at all, approaches the throne of God Almighty and takes the book from his hand. And suddenly the silence is broken. In verses 9 to 10, every voice in heaven begins to cry out, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals. Because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God persons of every tribe and every language and every people and every nation. Do you realize that there are people groups in our world today that nobody knows Jesus? But this verse says somebody will. It may not be the entire people group, but God will save a remnant. You may feel, Christian, like you're the only one at that office that knows Jesus, but God has got a remnant. You may feel like you're the only student in your entire class who knows Jesus and actually wants to follow Jesus, but he's got you there for a specific purpose at a specific time. You have made them to be a kingdom of priests to serve our God. That's why you're there. 
You are the priest in your position. You are the servant of God in that situation. And they will reign on the earth. This lamb, this gentle, innocent creature is the one to open the book. This one, not Gabriel, not Michael, as strong as he is, able to go toe-to-toe with Satan himself, not any of the elders on the thrones. It is, he is the only one who is worthy enough, holy enough, mighty enough, and strong enough to break the seals of God. Why? What is it that makes this lamb so holy? He died. What makes this lamb so worthy is that his innocent, blameless life was laid down for mankind, for the cursed creation, for everything that's been tainted by man's sin. He died and every chain of slavery broke. Every shackle of addiction crumbled. Every handcuff of opposition melted. He died and those whose sin had alienated them from God were redeemed. They were bought back for God. He died, and from his blood, a whole new creation was born. A few at first, then more until eventually all of creation will bow before him. Some will bow out of gratitude, and for them the new creation will be a paradise. Others will bow out of terror, and for them the new creation will be a terrible reminder of what they could have had. The lamb died. For you he died, and for me he died. But it is his willing death that makes him worthy. And all eternity will ring with that truth. The Lamb of God is worthy. Then John was told the third thing. The Savior of all is sufficient. In the final verses of this chapter, John is overwhelmed by his introduction to a real worship service. We like to worship, but we got nothing on what heaven does. Okay, even Hillsong or Elevation, then nah, 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 nah. they're just a practice setup. The real worship service, wow. I sat in a youth conference filled with 15,000 youth singing to newsboys and to other songs and other groups and other worship sets. And I tell you, the whole place just reverberated. That's nothing compared to heaven. No small worship team in heaven. Mm -mm. No choir of a hundred or even a thousand. No, no, no. Every voice, angelic or human, will join in worshiping the Lamb who is the Savior. Elsewhere in Revelation, John speaks of groups of up to 250 million. But how many make up this worship gathering? We don't know because John couldn't count that high. (laughs) All we're told here in verse 11 is that there were thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. John was overwhelmed, and we will be as well, as all of heaven breaks out in corporate worship of the Savior. With one voice and with one heart, in verse 12, they all cry out, Worthy is the Lamb who is slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. But that's only the first part of the song. As John listens, he hears an echo come back from the entire cosmos. In verse 13, it says, Every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and is all and all that is in them began to respond. I want you to imagine this. Every blade of grass, every moon around Jupiter, every ring around Saturn, Every grain of sand on every shore of every sea, every star in the heavens, every speck of dust in the air, every living being and even the stones of the ground begin to spontaneously respond in worship to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever and ever. As Jesus entered Jerusalem so long ago, the Pharisees heard the people praising God and they rebuked him, saying, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus replied in Luke 19.40, he says, I tell you the truth, if they keep quiet, 
the stones will cry out. Now, I recently heard somebody speak on this who said that he was standing in, in a graveyard on, right there in Jerusalem. He said, this is what Jesus rode past when that was being said to him. He said, what stones was Jesus talking about? He said he was talking about these tomb stones. If my disciples stay quiet, even the dead will start praising me. That's how worthy our God is. If the living won't do it, the dead will. If Sean won't, hey, Lazarus will just come out of the tomb and start praising instead. If the living are going to act dead, the dead are going to act living. That's the power of our God. That right there. Nothing is able to hold back its praise when you're talking about Jesus. Why? Because the Savior's work is not just for people. Everything that the curse of sin has affected is promised liberty on the cross. Not one thing created has been unaffected by the curse and not one created thing has been unaffected by the cross. Every piece of earth that has been cursed with thorns and thistles will be set free one day. Every animal and plant that has been cursed to grow old and die will be set free. Every created thing that has been cursed to slowly wear out, run down, grow old, fade away, blink out, cool off, or pass away will one day be restored, resurrected, reclaimed, rebuilt, renewed, and redone all because of the Savior's death. The Savior of all is sufficient for all. So tell me, if the Lion of Judah is able, what problem are you facing right now in your life? I don't care if it's small or big, wide or slim, heavy or light. Focus on that problem right now. Get it in your mind's eye for me right now. Now, it may seem like nobody can help you with it. Doesn't it feel like nothing can make it go away? I know that feeling. Every time somebody says, hey, Sean, how's the green card thing coming? <laughs> I got news for you. There's nothing I can do. Let me tell you that there is no problem on earth or in the corner of this vast universe that the Lion of Judah can't handle. There is no devil too old, no screw up too huge, no burden too heavy, no trial too big, no sin too addictive, no habit too crave, no bridge too burned, no history too long that the Lion of Judah can't solve. Jesus Christ, the Lion of Judah, longs to come into your life and make things right. Well, how can he do that? He's the Lion of Judah. He can do anything. Well, what if the Lamb of God is worthy, Sean? Well, in your life, do your actions and words proclaim that the Lamb is worthy? Are they more of a slap in the face to the one who died to set you free? Every man, woman, and child, every dog, cat, and grasshopper, every star, moon, and quasar has been shackled and chained by the curse of sin. That's why the lamb died. He died to break that shackle, to destroy that chain, to undo the curse so that you and I could live in freedom once more and to live in hope that one day we will be returned to Eden, that perfect, sinless, curseless paradise that we were actually created for. So are you free today? Or are you still shackled to the slaver? You don't have to be. Because the Lamb of God is worthy. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, longs to come into your life and set you free. I know all about that. I was stuck in addiction and stuck in anger and hatred. And when Jesus Christ came in, he brought something I'd never encountered. He brought in joy and set me free. How can he do that? Well, he's the Lamb of God, and he is worthy. Now, your life may be filled with unsolved problems or, or unshed burdens, but guess what? The Savior is sufficient. 
Your marriage may be made of unfulfilled promises and unanswered questions. Your kids may wrestle with uncertain futures and unsteady homes. Your parents may struggle with unpaid bills and unexciting lives, but not one of those things has to be. Jesus Christ can solve problems. He can remove burdens. He can fulfill promises. He can answer questions. He can provide certainty for your future, solidity for your home life, meet your needs, and give life new excitement and zest. In fact, he can do more than all that. He can save you. He can free you. He can restore you. He can redeem you. He can renew your heart, restore your hope, resurrect dreams long dead, rebuild foundations long crumbled. He can grant direction, give guidance, provide counseling, and heal hurts. The Savior is truly the one-stop shop for all of your needs. He has an incredible future for you. Read Jeremiah sometime. You'll find that out. He has an exciting plan for your life. Read the book of Acts. He has a rock-solid guarantee for your life. Read more of Revelation. And a death-defying dream for your eternity. What more could you ask for? What more could you want? Who else can you turn to? The Savior is sufficient. Folks, the problem of sin is real. Sin surrounds us in our world and overwhelms us in everything we do. Sin is what causes that problem between Israel and Gaza. Sin is the problem that lies between Russia and the Ukraine. Sin is the problem that causes cartels to flourish in countries south of the border. Sin is what causes us to mistrust the media and us to mistrust government. Sin is what causes one brother to dislike a brother to the point of murder. Sin is the problem. And the vaccine that is needed is not a what, but a who. It's Jesus Christ. It's the Lamb of God. It's the Lion of Judah. It's the Savior of all. And he is here right now. He wants to be right here right now. All that he asks is that we believe in him, repent of our sins, and follow him. We bow our knees, we surrender our heart, we give our life, and we let the problem of sin, and we let the punishment of sin, and we let the pain caused by sin slip off of our shoulders onto the only shoulders in the universe that can carry it. That's Jesus. So let's pray. Father, it doesn't take a scientist to know that our world is messed up. It doesn't take a sociologist to tell us that people are messed up. It doesn't take a politician to tell us that policies are messed up. We don't need more messing up, Lord. What we need is a Messiah who can fix it. God, I am so grateful that Jesus is that Lamb of God and he is worthy and he is able. And I just pray, Father, this morning that if there's anyone here today who has not yet bowed their knee to him or invited him in, that you would not wait a moment longer. I don't care if you've been going to church your whole life long or maybe you grew up in church or maybe you're third or fourth generation, but if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you cannot get into heaven on the coattails of your parents. God does not have grandchildren. If you're not a son or daughter of Jesus Christ, then you're not on the way to heaven. So Father, I pray this morning that you would challenge us with truth, that you would open our eyes to truth and help us, Father, to take truth in because your word does not just say that truth will set us free. It says you, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. We have to know Jesus to be set free by Jesus. And Father, we have an entire world out those doors that needs to know that too. And so I just pray, Father, this morning that as we go from here, help us to be the light out there. When the world says, I have a problem, help us to be able to say, Houston, you may have a problem, but I have the solution. 
and his name is Jesus Christ. Teach us, O Lord, to walk in your ways. In Jesus' name, amen. May God bless you. May he watch over you. May he strengthen you. May he equip you and uphold you. And in those days and in those times where you feel like you are not enough for the situation, you're not, but he is. God bless you. Have a great week.